this all started for you? I think uh, about it all the time, that how two people who don't know each other from Adam could come together uh, with ideas that they shared in, in their own minds and a random phone call and I remember correctly if I, I could be wrong it's a Friday yes it was um, and rushing to to get to the school uh, I get this phone call and Faisal Jacobs is <laughs> speaking to me and um, speaking about how he could benefit an organization or a community um, through running and um, wanting some ideas from me as if I, had, I knew all the answers, you know. I think that first phone call, we spoke for almost an hour. Um, and that's, 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 I'm still, uh, still amazed. And, and when people, people sometimes speak about how long I know fun, and I'm like, no, it's not very long. Um, it's just, it's amazing how we just synced and, and uh, sort of clicked. Um, um, and, and the friendship and, and the relationship that kind of just happened. Always at, 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 at some level been involved with sport and, and when you grow older you don't become that competitive and when I studied uh, um, coaching science um, it was about giving back um, what I've learned um, and I started coaching kids in, in, in junior cricket and I was very fortunate um, and it was a huge blessing for me to, to coach a bunch of kids from under nine level uh, uh, in cricket um, who couldn't catch a ball <laughs> um, and coach them all the way up to uh, under 15 level. Um, uh, and that was an amazing journey on, on, on many aspects. Um, the kids I coached were from a fairly affluent area, um, played for age meet. Um, so they, they had, they weren't needy kids. And we played against the likes of born people like Haderfeld. They don't have. Mm. Um, I remember calling off with, with huge reluctance. And I think my kids hated me that day, but it, it was the right call to make. There was about an over and a half left. This game was tense. <laughs> Edge me that two wickets left. Um, we needed something like nine runs. Um, Haderfeld were, I think it's the closest they came to a win that season. Um, and I took all the game off. Um, the feel that they had, and, and we played on a mat, and it, they never had any pegs to hold that mat down, and that wind kept coming up, and I had to unroll our batsman. He, he, he looked like a spring roll. <laughs> I had to unroll him from the mat um, and, and this wind just wouldn't die. And, and it just got a bit too dangerous. And, and we called the game off. Um, because they, that club never had um, the likes of playing in Cooks um, uh, and in the poorer parts there. Um, seeing those, I'm like, oh man, some, some, something's got to give you. Uh, these kids can't grow up like this. Uh, You've you got to do something. And that, that thought was there, it was always there, and, and I was looking for how can I make this happen. Then, 2016, um, it was towards the end of March, that phone call. <laughs> and it was about getting a project going, um, or, or trying to get a project going. And I was, I, I was looking for advice from people, and I was phoning around and, and by one of the radio stations speak to Irfan, he's done this amazing million rand challenge and he ran all over the world <laughs> and I'm like, is he going to have time for me? <laughs> Mitchell's Plain teacher has raised almost a million rand for underprivileged schools. Irfan Abrams ran the New York Marathon in 2011 and the Chicago Marathon last year. Later this month, it will be the Amsterdam Marathon as part of his one million rand challenge. Let's take a listen. The Rocklands High School teacher raised 600,000 Rand for fundraising projects when running the New York and Chicago marathons. Abrams hopes to break the million Rand barrier with the Amsterdam Marathon. He enlisted the help of schools, running clubs, and other organizations 
who use donation cards to collect five rand for every kilometer he runs. We've helped kids to come off the street, got them into running, got them into cycling. And as an educator, you usually get a bad rap for um, all the negativities in education. But you know what? Maybe with this running and um, cycling, you can show that teachers can make a difference as well as inspire other educators to get more involved in extramural activities because that's what's going to save our kids nowadays. Beneficiaries include an older age home, cancer charities, and this year, it will be the turn of Glendale High School in Mitchell's Plain. We're also linking up with the Amsterdam Runners Association, where they are helping, going to be helping Glendale High School build the first ever athletics track in Mitchell's Plain. Mitchell's Plain is plagued by gangsterism and drugs, but Abrams, who sees himself as an ordinary teacher, trying to do something extraordinary, is making a difference. Craig Murray, SABC News, Cape Town. A good sookie. Boyki from the Cape Flats that has always had dreams of becoming a professional sportsman and, and traveling the world. That dream never disappeared of, of wanting to see the world and um, not realizing that the Million Rand Challenge was going to afford one that opportunity, but also in the same breath um, benefiting uh, something that's very close to me, education and, and learners who are less fortunate. We set ourselves um, a challenge of in five years to raise a million rand. Um, Alhamdulillah, I can confidently say with the likes of good friends, and we were a small team of Hassan and Abdullah and Fatima and Kasifa and Tasneem. There were so many who started off the project that weren't there at the end, but those were the, the guys who put it together. After the third year, when we finished the Amsterdam Marathon, we had already raised more than a million rand. And, um, having lived in London and going back to do the London Marathon and having my wife with me that was that was e epic having to raise even more money so we raised close on to just more than two million rand and I think very importantly to to all those who who are being gonna be that are here and and being part of the Lace Up for Change um, NPO is that it's not the amount of dollars of money you have in your pocket that's going to that's going to determine your success it's the near and the intention because we had a good intention and that good intention has led us to the success that we have and it's success not success where we put feathers in our uh, in our caps okay. and you know walk broad shouldered is to show that if you if you share a vision with people and you can let them buy into that vision that you can, with their contribution, we can make a difference in people's lives. That's what's most important. Because from having absolutely nothing, we had people come on board that, not ne that never gave us money necessarily, but gave us in their expertise. Let's just say from there, you know, Allah works in mysterious ways. It was another chance meeting after that at, at a meeting where we got to actually see who one another were face to face. And I think that just um, started in a relationship to where we find ourselves now and um, not realizing that two people have a, that have a passion for wanting to do something in, for the community can actually come together to where we find ourselves now taking one major leap to putting together a group of like-minded people to share in, in, in our dreams and um, starting an MPO um, Lace Up for Change. I'm constantly reminded that people come into your life for a reason. Um, some are lessons, um, some stay, um, some don't. Um, and the whole journey that, 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 that started, um, that got us here, it's just, it's, it's amazing how the building blocks of people just, just fell into place um, with very little effort, and we ended up doing the uh, FMB 12-1 with the with the kids from Red Cross, uh, pushing them through um, the streets from Malmeton to Cape Town. What actually preceded that FMB 12 run? So three weeks um, um, before the run. Uh, I was diagnosed with rectal cancer um, 
and the doctor wants to do the surgery immediately and that's it in now um, not for the reasons um, you would think immediately uh, there wasn't a fear uh, I didn't want this I had worked on this project I've been wanting it to go and we were two weeks away uh, um, from from the run. Sorry, I three weeks. Uh, up, yeah. yeah, I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna do this. The cancer's there. It's not gonna go anywhere, and three weeks isn't gonna make a difference. Well, not a huge difference. But that was the best thing I could have done for me. Um, the those kids um, that I met that day, uh, well, the week before, um, and then the day of the race. Because they were in wheelchairs, we, we had to line up pretty much before most of everyone because we, we, uh, uh, the, the event organizers allowed us to leave um, before the rest of the pack. They gave us a head start, so we're not caught up in, in, in the bunch. So we strapped these kids into the wheelchairs about an hour before <laughs> the gun went. Um, I think we, we, we probably did that 12 kilometer run in record time. If I remember correctly, we came in a minute shy of two and a half hours for the 12 kilometers. Um, but it wasn't about doing that run very quick. Um, we were sharing these kids' stories along the way. So that three and a half hours that these boys and girls were strapped in those chairs, um, Mia, um, who had had heart, uh, liver transplant, um, uh, had uh, heart surgery, I believe. You had Dakira, who's yeah, had um, the, the congenial, congenial heart. heart disorder. She's had brain surgery. Um, you had Liam and Ishrat, who have brittle bones. Um, and I mean, to hear some of the stories from those parents and on, on, on how. Uh, fragile they are. Um, uh, I remember Edwina saying she turned while breastfeeding Liam and she just heard pop pop and he started screaming and while she was breastfeeding him she broke two of his ribs. Um, that's how brutal they are. Um, there wasn't one complaint from them. That three and a half hours stuck in a chair being pushed through in that heat there were just smiles and the people who didn't know them that came and yes we got a lot of praise for what we were doing and that it wasn't about that it was the high fives that these kids done and that, that awesome job and, and and coming in to that finish um, there was about 500 meters to go and you've got this long stretch and there's people on either side of you we were the lot of the last people coming in here but the cheers and the applause uh, that we got and the excitement that filled up these kids' faces um, made me think there and then um, this is nothing, this cancer is nothing. Um, they're going through a lot worse uh, and look at them. Um, and, and, and that became an inspiration for me, uh, uh, especially during my recovery. What made you do the type of of work in the communities, where uh, does that story start? Um, I think the story goes back to where I have to draw my strength from my parents who uh, were not professionals as in a nine to five uh, behind a desk office type of job. My mom uh, worked tirelessly, tirelessly in, in a factory, clothing factory. My dad was a tradesman on, uh, as on the construction site. And um, mom used to have this amazing energy. She'd be the first one up in the morning, the last one up at night. She'd be making donuts and cusistas. And um, if she could get hold of anything that would benefit the girls at work at a cheaper price, um, she'd be putting this together. That's where the journey actually started subconsciously and we didn't realize it. And that was the seed that was planted to where just um, somebody with limited resources making a difference in, in, in other people's lives because the people that she worked with and, and the ladies within the factory were benefiting 
from um, you know delicacies that they would not necessarily be able to afford had they gone to a shop and here comes somebody and, and makes it for them and we were part of the journey waiting at Athlon station with her with the carrier bags to help her to go home um, that was where the journey actually started and and well I mean you don't realize how our life um, you know changes and takes place within you subconsciously mm. and you say how did the journey start for me I always wanted to do something within the community and somebody asked me a question um, as a teacher what did you like to leave behind um, for other learners and, 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 and your learners that have gone through your, your teaching experience and it made me think but it didn't make me think to an extent where I knew what it was that they were going to do. I loved working with kids. I loved um, getting involved in helping people. But it was never something formal um, until 2010 where I woke up one morning to find my, my face disfigured. And I would never ever forget that morning because the look on my on my wife's face on my children and we thought it was a once-off you know must have eaten something um, and uh, looking back uh, it just continued and it got so bad one evening having to go to hospital and lying on the bed and and I'd never forget the doctor coming in and telling me that you know what it's nothing to to worry about but um, you have what they call angioedema at first, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't much. I asked questions. I had to do some research. And, and, and you know what? Being a teacher, um, this is my teaching tool. Yeah. You know, I, I can't hide my face. How, how am I going to teach the learners? And I think 2010 was a challenging year. What exactly is angioedema? Um, it's where the soft tissues within your, in your, in your, in your, in your face and within parts of your hand and your feet it swells up. It's like a an allergic reaction. Um, uh, only it's not. It's got nothing to do with what you have eaten. I've done some research there. Up to now, there's not much papers having written, been written about it. And um, I, I had a, a fantastic support uh, from a principal uh, at the time, um, Mr. Hassan, who I had to open up to. I come to school with my face closed with the Palestinian scarf and he gave me the support to 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 actually face what was uh, what lied ahead of me um, and having to come to terms with it and um, the stories I can tell you about how do I to empower my grade 12 class to um, tell them what it was um, that had affected me if I had come to school with the Palestinian scarf and like I did uh, at the beginning, obviously, I'd stayed at home about two or three days a week because that's how badly it affected me. And um, it was a fantastic journey. I had to use what, what I think I have in, within me is the power of humor. And I used that to, to overcome my journey by having to share with them that they had to be comfortable with who they were. And that's how I became comfortable with what was awaiting me. And I, the, the, the morning I actually, when I, was, when I had the, the bout of angioedema, I came to school and I'll never forget that morning where I had spoken to them previously and having to actually show them what it's all about. Oh. And removing that, that scarf, that veil that morning, to have them first, to tell them that, listen, we're going to have a good laugh now. Because if you think that pictures were photoshopped, Here's the reality and having to remove that veil that dead silence of a rather energetic and vociferous class I couldn't be weak in 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 breaking down I had to be the strong person and I didn't tell the story to many people actually I haven't told the story um, where that morning they looked at me and they saw reality within in front of them and I must say the rest is history. I, when I'd wake up, woke up in the morning and my young daughter, uh, Noah, coming to me and say, Daddy, it's like that again. I'd get that strength and wake up and put on the scarf and, and go to school. 
because I know that my matriculants, when they saw the scarf, they had already empowered one another to say, it's not one of those good days. We need to help sir along here. Yeah. Well, I, that will stay with me forever. And um, things just moved, moved on. And um, that's when that reality in what do I want to leave behind? Because angioedema is not life-threatening. It is, but it's also not. The only time that it is is when your, your uh, esophagus swells up with your tongue. And when that happens, you need to get to, to hospital as soon as you can because your, 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 your breathing passage gets blocked up. And that's when um, the billion rand challenge started. A week after the surgery, when I spoke with the oncologist, um, and, he, and, and he gave me the news that uh, cancer, they got it all. Um, uh, it's now just becoming a case of watching it. I realized I got a second chance here, um, and I've got to make the most of it. Um, and I can't put things off. And it was also at the same time where I got the opportunity, or the offer, really. But nobody, including myself, didn't think it was the right thing to do. And I was to run in the Chicago Marathon um, as a cancer survivor, raising funds for, for, for the pediatric um, oncology hospital. And then I found this guy funny again that I just had this one race with and one meeting. <laughs> And I was like, listen, buddy, <laughs> so, Can I do this? <laughs> you know, I had this surgery, right? <laughs> you think about two and a half months is enough time to train for a marathon. Because up until that point, the furthest I've run was that 12 k's, which was more of a walk than a run. And, and I'll never forget your words. Um, you said to me, 40% of a marathon. Is, is your physical condition. 60% um, is the mental. So if your mental state is right, I'm sure you can. Um, and that just constantly reverbed. And I made the decision, I made the commitment, the near, I'm gonna do this. I started running 3Ks every other day on the treadmill. Um, this was major surgery, so I had no cause then. Um, um, on, a, on a female equivalent, it's, it's pretty close to having an hysterectomy. Um, <clears throat> um, so I had no cause thing. And, and I spoke, obviously spoke to the doctor about this. He told me you're nuts. <laughs> um, and his advice to me was if it hurts, stop. But the only restriction he put on me was no weight training, no strength training, just that. Um, and that's all I could do. And September was three weeks to go to Chicago. I got in three weeks of strength training. Uh, in a time when I'm supposed to be tapering down. Um, and I went over. Um, having only run 21 kilometers as the furthest I've run. Um, and it was such a remarkable experience uh, I'm running this. Um, for these kids of Palestine. And I picked up so much inspiration during the race um, from people, um, seeing people and, and some interactions that I've had. Um, and then tying up with the involvement of the Bubaran and what I was seeing in this race, that, that race solidified, you need to do more, you, you, you have to do more. Um, the conversation that you have in your head running a marathon with 47,000 people around you, um, you're alone, you're on your own. That led me to have that conversation with you about merging your idea, merging my idea, and, and, and trying to make a difference in the lives of, of those most vulnerable. A message to the people that are, are watching this, this clip? Don't wait for a second chance, um, uh, for anything really, whether it is, is, is love, whether it is being involved in a project, um, apologizing to someone. Um, you don't know 
um, if you're going to have that second chance. I think both you and I can relate that. Um, we have that. And not a lot of people get that. Um, life changes in an instant. Um, my life changed in an instant. I, I thought I had hemorrhoids. Um, I had cancer. Um, and, and things could have gone so differently. Um, seize, seize the opportunities that you have. Um, whether it is being involved in, 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 in a project such as this, uh, um, or whether it is enjoying the next moment with a loved one. You have touched my soul. How are you to know? You are my hero.